Africa or in some underdeveloped third world countries of the world, and you understand that there's just a lot of poverty, and many of you who have visited areas that can be described as poor, you know, you understand what I'm talking about. Lodebar. Will there be one who is great that will come out of Lodebar? There's none. And so here comes this man, Mephibosheth. And so what is the reality of this loving Savior? Friends, the fact that He has provided salvation, full and free, to every one of us without limit, right? Became real at the cross. God, in Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, the word uses demonstrated. God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that is the demonstration, the highest demonstration of God's love. It is there at Calvary. And we said that the result of this love is what? Verse 5. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. So what happened to Mephibosheth as a result of the king searching him out, right? Was that he was taken out of that barren land, unproductive, into the palace. Totally different, right? Totally opposed, you know, uh, totally opposing end of that spectrum. <clears throat> when you think of his social status, when you think of the, 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 the social economical aspect of it, nothing, there's nothing that can be compared. There's nothing similar. It's total opposite from a land that is poor and barren, like I said, no hope, unproductive, into the palace of the king. But there's everything. But there's everything. So, friends, we have a very loving Savior that sought us out. It's not you, but it's God who sought after you. Remember the story. From the very beginning that man had fallen, man started not only to run away from God, but man was found hiding from God. Where are you, Adam? God asked. Walking in that garden after the fall. Now they were, they found themselves, you know, subconscious of their nakedness. Guilt was what they carried. So they were scared. When Cain killed Abel, what did Cain do? He went away. He ran away. He went hiding. And God sought after him, him looking for him. So the story of God and man since then was that God, you know, is chasing man. God pursuing man. Man running away. Flee. Afraid. Guilty. Embarrassed. Was that how you felt? And you realize that you're such a rotten sinner, just like how I felt. You know, I, and I recognize my own wretchedness. My, my need for a savior. For salvation. Psalms chapter 40 verse number 2 says, He brought me up also out of the horrible pit. That's how David described it. He was brought up out of the horrible pit from the miry clay and set my feet upon the rock and praise God. That's what he did for you and that's what he did for every believer that turned from sin into acknowledging the grace of God that's made available. Now let's talk about as a picture of a lost sinner. Now, in verses 6 and 7, right? Verse number 6. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. This is what we're talking about in our Sunday school. Worship. Reverence, right? And David said, Mephibosheth, period. You notice that? That's the only thing he said. Mephibosheth. Period. And he answered, Behold thy servant. So, number one. God will call your name. See, I explained to you last Sunday that this offer is universal. Right? But it becomes more meaningful and special to you as an individual human being in this world. When you realize that God chose you out of the many. When you realize the, the reality or the truthfulness of what was said in Ephesians chapter number 5, that you and I were chosen, when? From before the foundation of this world. 
And God said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, before you were born, I already know you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And David testified in 139 and saw, right? Behold, you know, you already know me, right? From everything, even from my, from my mother's womb, you already know me. You know, yesterday I was meditating on a passage in the book of Job in chapter number 31. And that chapter tells us how, how that God is the creator of all. So that those that are in the womb was created by God. That God already knew you from the womb. That's how, how, to me it's not simple, but it's profound. And how can God know everything? Well, He is God. He is omniscient. I cannot even, even begin to understand with my limited understanding the amount, the wealth of knowledge that God has. Knowing everything that you are, past, present, and future, everything that you will be, everything that you have, everything in this world, everything that is in this solar system, everything in our own galaxy and other galaxies outside of us, everything in His entire creation. How can He know that? Where did He come from? He came from nowhere. No one, no one created Him. That's why He is God. He existed in eternity past. Right? And He's not limited in, in, in any way. So He is the omniscient God who knows everything. He's the everywhere present God. Amen? And He is also the all-powerful, almighty God that we have. And that's the kind of God that saved you. With man, it is impossible you know, to save uh, people, sinners like us. It is impossible. Remember how, how Jesus put it? If the rich man cannot be saved, how, how will they be saved? You know what Jesus said? It is easier for a camel to pass through, go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. My goodness. What he's showing to us there is some type of a hyperbole, hyperbole right? An exaggeration. In order for us to understand, you know, the, the impossibility of that happening through human ability. But you know what Jesus said after that? With God, everything is possible. How could God save a wretched, rotten, filthy, vile sinner as I was? And I am. Did it change the fact that I carry a sinful nature within me? Did it change the fact that we're still in this world craving for the things of the world? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Did it change the fact, right, that, that we're sinners? No, we're still sinners. But what changed? When Christ came in my heart, and in my life, when Christ came into your lives, what was changed? What changed was not your religion. What changed was your relationship with God. From a person who didn't have any relationship with God at all, like I said, alienated from God, right? Separated from God, no harmony with God, into a person who is considered his child now. Romans, uh, I mean, John 1 12. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege, the power to be called God's children, so, so that you're now sons and daughters of God. So there is an important fact that we must address at this point. It was the common practice for the kings of this, you know, this time in history that when the, 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 the king is subdued, the king is overcome, and now he's dead, all the rest will have to die. Understand? Thank God that is not the way it is these days. Can you imagine? It is not about whether you, you are alive or, or you die, right? This is not a question of life and death. But now, it's okay. Here's the president. His term is over. Here comes another president. No one dies. Thank God. Praise God. All right? Not always the case, right? That there are some people who die because of politics, rivalry, and all that. But back in those days, in David's time, King Saul had to die. Jonathan had to die. Every one of them had to die. All his servants, all the ones that are close to him had to die. Get rid of them. So there's eradicate or totally erase the possibility of a rebellion. 
That is the whole purpose of it. And so when all of them had died, and of course it brought sadness to the heart of David that even Jonathan, his best friend, died. 